I'm going to give a very quick, uh, a very quick introduction to Sean. Um, I had to go to Tucson, Arizona to meet Sean in 2013 at the Native American Culinary Association Conference, which I do have to say just of, uh, I hope that comes back at some point. Nephi Craig planning that was just uh, amazing. And for me, a great revolutionary in terms of just thinking about structuring events and, you know, the first time going and having a, a conference through the the perspective of indigenous foods and, and culinary that's where I met Sean um, and, you know, can't even really, <laughs> can't even give enough of a, of a words of the Sean, the journey that Sean's been on in the past decade uh, plus. So it's been pretty amazing and Sean will be able to give a little bit of a picture of, of some of, of that journey. All right. So I'm a Takiape, Wambli Watakpe and Ichiape. My name is Sean Sherman. Um, I'm from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Um, I said in Lakota that my native name is Charging Eagle, which sounds pretty tough, but it just means I spend too much money on credit cards. It's a true story. <laughs> so I'm going to go through this really quick. Not everybody's seen this presentation, but some of you guys have because there's a lot of very familiar faces. And I have uh, 20 minutes. I'm going to 22 minutes. I'm going to see what I can do in 22 minutes. And I'd love to try to get through uh, 100 slides in 22 minutes and uh, maybe have a room for one or two questions. So let's see what happens. But if they can't have questions, catch me after because we'll be here for the tasting and all the stuff. So obviously, um, like I said, I'm from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and um, I moved to Minneapolis at a pretty young age. I started working in restaurants when I was very young. I was only 13 years old and I was working for touristy restaurants. And I moved to Minneapolis and just uh, continued cooking because uh, I started working in the Black Hills as a kid in the restaurant scene, moved to Minneapolis, made my way up to a chef position. And uh, just that kind of started off a career, but it was kind of an accident. I didn't mean to be a chef, it just happened to me. Um, but anyways, um, this the journey that I want to talk about is just understanding indigenous foods because some of you guys have watched some of my TED talks some of you guys have know know a little bit about me uh, I live in Minneapolis I have a restaurant how many people have been to Awamini in here that's a good that's not a bad number that's not a bad number so uh, Awamini is a full service Native American restaurant um, it follows our philosophy of showcasing what modern indigenous foods are capable of our philosophy was removing dairy wheat flour cane sugar beef pork chicken basically colonial ingredients in general um, to showcase what are what are modern uh, North American indigenous foods and uh, it's been very popular and that's uh, been a big journey but beyond that we have a on profit that I'll talk about. But before that, I just want to talk about the journey, because some of this was just trying to understand what Native American foods were, especially growing up as a chef. Um, quite a few years back, I just kind of had an epiphany of trying to figure out, like, why, like, I, I, I studied food from all over the world. You know, I learned about food from, every, from all over the place, you know, and I knew hundreds of European recipes off the top of my head in European languages and didn't know anything about Lakota foods, really. I could name just a handful of things that were actually Lakota that weren't influenced by another, like, out, outside influence. So it sent me on a path to understand like what were pre-colonial foods, right? And this journey took me into having a deeper understanding to not only what those foods were that I was searching for and what was missing, but also what happened in history to us as indigenous peoples, which we've touched on a lot because it's a big part of the whole situation. It's a big reason why we don't have Native Americans in every single, or sorry, we don't have Native American restaurants in every single city, you know, because that's just a, you know, that's a reality right now today. Like it's really difficult to find any kind of Native American eating space um, to feature the land and the food and the culture and language and the people and all the things. And we need to change that. And it's changeable because we showcase that it's possible. You know, we built this model in Minnesota. So my work really became talking about um, what, we're, what we lost and why we lost it and going from there. So this talk, I like to talk about colonialism because obviously we have touched on it because it is a topic, but colonialism is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control, occupying the settlers, exploiting it economically, which obviously is not unique to North America, but has happened across the globe. North America, South America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. It keeps going. Like there's been so many regions around the world and we're connected to indigenous peoples across the globe because of our shared trauma of living through colonialism basically on a massive scale. 
And so for us, it was divine. It was basically creating a philosophy around decolonization because one way to decolonize is just to reverse colonization, but that's not very realistic because we're living in a whole new world of and ways of things, you know. So it's not a philosophy of just pretending colonization didn't happen, but it's a it's a it's a philosophy of moving forward. So for me, it was a philosophy of comparing the values between um, what happened what's been normalized in our lifetime as, col as colonization has happened to us compared to the values of for, from indigenous perspectives. So values of Eurocentric colonialism is imperialism, expansionism, capitalism, exploitation of natural resources, dehumanization of people of color, individualism, cultural assimilation, scientific rationalization, and land ownership are just a few of those pieces that is very normal in our lifespan. Like we just, this is things that are just out there and we just live with because it's just the way things are. But when we're looking at values from indigenous communities, we're looking at a much larger focus on community, um, land stewardship, community-based food systems, reciprocity and sharing, oral traditions and education. Um, oops, I doubled that one up because it's doubly important, but equitable and consensus-based decision-making, respect for elders, deep connection to land spaces, and vast education of plants, because plants give us everything, food, medicine, lodging, tools, weapons, toys, you name it, like plants can give us everything we need, right? So I really enjoy teaching about colonization because it's something that is really important. And we're living in a weird world where some states are trying to reverse education. They're trying to re-whitewash already whitewashed history, you know, and taking away our indigenous perspectives that we haven't even really had. We've been invisible for too long and we're just getting to a point where we're starting to talk about these things. And now states are trying to reverse that completely and to completely remove black and indigenous education and historical perspective from history because of because of comfort, you know, so it's so stupid, right? So we have to fight against that. We have to just be teaching about this and we have to make sure that this education gets out there for everybody. Because in America, we have to remember that we're a very young, young country, you know? I feel like we're kind of like in our toddler phase, the way we're acting right now. And uh, and because like in the year 1800, like we hadn't expanded very far and 1800 is not that long ago. Right. We're still basically the 13 colonies. Ohio is the Western frontier in the year 1800. You know, we're still battling England at that time period. And so, like, you know, you guys have seen these maps before, but it's important to understand that it's one century of 1800 to 1900, because that's when things go really horribly awry. This is not moving. There we go. So, but during that one century, that's when things are really aggressive. And this is one of the most pivotal points because there was already aggressiveness before the United States becomes, uh, uh, becomes the United States, um, you know, but what happens when they set their sights on the West and the West sort of expansion, it moves very fast, you know, within, within a lifetime, li literally, you know, cause so much of this, uh, so much of this trauma happens within a very short time period, within about 70 years, you know, and California wipes out almost its entire population, probably 98% of its population is wiped off the map in a 20 year period between 1850 and 1870 because of bounty systems. Same similar thing in, in Minnesota by kicking out all Ho-Chunk and Dakota people because basically for the farmland that they were on because of colonization, you know, and so it's important to understand that at the beginning of the 1800s, probably 85% of what the landmass was still stewarded by indigenous peoples by the end of that century, less than 2% because of the reservation systems that were put out there. So it's just important to remember that because this is more than colonization. This is actually what I like to see is, or not, I mean, I identify it as eliminationism because that's what the policy was against indigenous peoples. The only value that we had as indigenous peoples was the land that we were standing on because the, the, colon, the colonial machine of the U.S. government was just out to get as much land as possible because they learned they could make an immense amount of money off of that land space, which they absolutely did. And, you know, you can trace all of this throughout American history, um, how, we're, how we're dehumanized right off the bat with the Declaration of Independence, which was the Dear John or Dear George letter that the, that the Founding Fathers sent to England to break up with England, basically, right? Um, and, you know, these things like the Northwest import, uh, Ordinance is super important to know what that is, because if you fly out in these areas and look out your window and you see this, that, this was the justification of the land theft, you know, and it's still 
it's still a cornerstone to the whole situation of colonization in America and how they're looking at, you know, building out, securing land spaces and justifying the taking over those land spaces. And it goes on and on, you know, throughout the U.S. history of the acts from Washington, um, the Homestead Act of 1862, the Morrill Act of 1862, which create land grant universities like this one right here, um, which gave them lots of land spaces to benefit from which a lot of universities still hold a lot of land spaces um, and then still benefit from that. Dawes Act of 1887. And during this time period, we see so much loss of our own food access as indigenous peoples. Um, we've learned about the destruction of the bison. Not everybody understands that the US government was extremely intentional about that. And I think you should definitely watch the Ken Burns documentary, which really helps lay out that history very clearly and plainly, because this was a very specific move by the US government to just to hurt the indigenous communities in the West that they were going after, especially around the Civil War time. But what was really damaging for us as indigenous peoples was the loss of our own education systems, which is why it's really important to really build our education systems back because our indigenous perspective of, of education is a really important one. Not everything has to have a Eurocentric perspective, you know, academia has you know, Eurocentric academia has claimed its own throne by saying it's just the utmost. They're the ones that decide which papers are out there and who's writing what and the, all the pieces. But as indigenous academics, we don't have to follow those rules because we can change, you know? So it's really important to know that there's other perspectives of everything out there. And there's so much diversity amongst indigenous peoples on a global scale that we should really be focused on that. Because my grandparents' generation at the turn of the century should have been downloading all of that generational knowledge, but instead it's replaced because of the assimilation programs that get set forth at the turn of the century, um, trying to civilize us as indigenous peoples, turning us into non-savages, basically, right? And if you've ever gone to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania or, or studied about the Carlisle Indian School, this is kind of ground zero for where this whole system starts. And it's a really awful school because all of these kids speaking different languages, different religions, coming from different areas are forced to come here. It's a military run school. They're subjected to all sorts of trauma, which we're still dealing with today. Sexual abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, death, and all these things are just reverberating across across generations, you know? And it's, you know, it's one thing to call out a priest or somebody for, you know, some bad things that happen to you, but it's harder when that get, trauma gets passed down in our own families and it's your uncle, it's your grandma or, or grandpa or somebody else is doing that to us too. So it gets really complicated, but if we're indigenous, everybody is touching this boarding school system and it's it's a tough history and it's a shared trauma that we have to deal with and figure out how to move forward with. And part of it's just naming it for what it is, is one step to it. Because um, obviously these happen all over the United States, all over the territories, all over Canada's residential schools, which are still alive into the 1990s. Um, and there's just a lot going on with this situation to unpack um, and understanding where so much of our trauma came from directly in a very short time period again, just because this happened throughout the 1900s. So our indigenous experience in the 1900s isn't much better because um, there's lots of things. There's, uh, we're not citizens until 1924. You know, we, uh, they, they have to define us at that time period because they didn't have a law for us at that time. So they create the Racial Integrity Act. And you should read about the Pocahontas Clause because it's super messed up. And it's just like a whole bunch of this. It's a constant situation, you know. And this, so my grandparents are born before they're citizens, as I'm sure a lot of people have grandparents that had that same story situation. Uh, we go through many generations of the Indian termination and relocation policies, just like the story of Menominee that we we're just listening to. Um, we go through, uh, this one's the worst one that I think, it's because of the Indian adoption era from 1941 to 1967, where the statistic says one out of three Native children are pulled from their homes and put into non-Native families. And that's a, big, that's a big number. One out of three is a big, big number, you know, and that's just another form of cultural uh, genocide. And can't vote until 1965. And, you know, it's not really gotten any better because things are just being gerrymandered and it's just making harder and harder for Native votes to, to happen out there. Just people of color in general, you know, because white supremacy is holding on hard to the power that it's gained over the past couple of centuries. And it doesn't like to see that power being dismantled, which has been happening. But now there's this big pull to try to re-grasp some of that power. So uh, we can't uh, celebrate our free... Our free uh, our religious freedoms until 1978, which is definitely within my lifetime, and I'm sure a lot of people here too. And that's also a very important thing to remember because our country has always gone on about freedom of religion and just never applied to the first peoples that lived here. 
And so post-colonial Native America, you know, colonization has never ended. It's still happening in many forms all across the world still today. And it's good to, it's not good, but it's important to identify where colonization is happening um, for what it is, because it's a very simple definition and you can apply it to so many things happening all over the place because it's just land grabbing and it's, you know, taking natural resources and it's making somebody really rich and it's dehumanizing the people that are living next to those land resources too. And so for us growing up, you know, with a lot of our food being replaced, our nutrition being replaced, we've seen all these health epidemics, which people have been talking about throughout the day, high rates of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, all these things. These have a direct connection to our government that's been feeding us a lot of this and creating this access for us that's not good for us, you know. So that's why we have to understand indigenous food systems moving forward. So understanding indigenous food systems is understanding diversity and it's understanding um, how just geologically uh, the eco regions of North America are extremely diverse. And, you know, when we layer indigenous peoples, you know, you can see it through a, a language map because that's, there's a lot of indigeneity out there, you know, and indigenous peoples were living from the tropics through to the Arctic, you know, everywhere, every, everywhere people were living and figured out how to survive because they had the privilege of having countless generations of knowledge to know how to live in the environment that they were living in. And so, you know, we have these, these numbers change here and there sometimes, but about 634 tribes in Canada, 574 in the U.S., 20% of Mexico identifying as indigenous. That number is actually much larger in Mexico because you could just see it in the DNA. Like there's definitely a lot of indigeneity um, down that way. And there's just no comparison to colonial borders, you know. So it doesn't matter who's speaking Spanish, English, or French. Those are colonial languages. Those are foreign languages. English is a foreign language on this land space, and we need to be identifying that, and we need to be looking at the immense diversity that we should be understanding and working towards that instead of trying to homogenize everything into the same way. And looking at what's been done with our land spaces, I like this map because it kind of breaks it out a little bit just to showcase what are we doing with our colonial land spaces nowadays, you know? And it's, a, it's not great, you know, because a lot of this is still built on capitalism. A lot of this is still built on making money and not the embitterment of people, not the embitterment of community, not the embitterment of soil and nature. It's really still ca very capitalistic how our land space is kind of portioned out and we're not taking care of it, you know. So indigenous knowledge is extremely important because it it has all of these pieces, you know, and I'm not going to name everything through here, but there's a lot of pieces when it comes to indigenous knowledge. There's a lot of education that we can be looking at from our own perspective. So understanding food knowledge, which was kind of where I come from, because I'm just a chef, you know, I just liked food and I think everybody likes food. It's our one language that we do share in common, no matter who we come from or what politics we believe in or what religion we're in, like everybody loves food because we need it every day to survive. So food should be the most important thing and we should be really thinking about where our food comes from and what kind of food we're thinking about, you know? We should be very proud of the foods that came out of the Americas because so many foods are normalized across the globe today. And so many of them, we don't get the attention of actually really being where these foods come from, you know? What is Northern Italy without polenta or Belgium without chocolate, you know? Or Ireland without potatoes, you know? So there's like so much to think about where these foods come from and we should be very proud of that. But colonizers have, you know, taken claim to so many of these foods on a grander scale. Because there's so much benefit of indigenous diets, healthier fats, low, uh, more diverse proteins, low carbs, low salts, a lot of plant diversity, uh, better or agricultural practices, cultural and regional diversities, regional and seasonal based food systems, you know. And there's so much food out there, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of eating food if it's not a cow, a pig or a chicken, which is why we remove those from our restaurant and the foods that we're doing right now today, because there's so much to talk about out there. Even, you know, insect, and there's a lot, there's a lot of protein out there. We shouldn't be afraid of it, you know, because these are very normal in so many areas, you know. But for us, what, how to really help connect us is plant knowledge. Plant knowledge really gives us the power that our ancestors had. And that's reclaimable. We can have that reclamation easily by studying it, getting to know it, stop calling everything a weed, because that just means you don't know what it is. Go outside and start to learn the names of the plants, the trees, you know. I always tease that our kids can name more, I used to say Kardashians, I think that's getting into an old joke, but um, I would say our kids can name more Kardashians than they can tree species, you know, and it's true because like we're not, what are we teaching, you know, we have to be teaching our indigenous focused education and, and plants have so much power because there's, again, everything we can do with plants, you know, and if we open up our eyes and start to see it, there's so much, so much out there, there's so much out there and we should be doing everything we can to really understand the true power of all of this uh, just dynamic, diverse 
eco region around us and all this plant life around us and creating a connection to it, not trying to capitalize it because you can make 50 bucks a pound off of morale mushrooms, but trying to understand how we can live with it and how we can help us with our own communities, you know. And understanding the history of foods, understanding how did we get energy, because as humans, we need building blocks, you know, we need sodiums, we need um, some way to get energy, which is usually carbs or fats or something like that, right? So, um, you know, Timsala, which is a prairie turnip that I grew up with on the plains and around Pine Ridge, uh, Camas root in the Pacific Northwest, Northern California, those regions, Great Basin, um, wild rice, of course, which is such an amazing, and amazing product, you know, but we've destroyed so many waterways um, for people to have lake cabins and jet ski and blah, blah, blah. And like, we should be really protecting and, and, and celebrating the growth of some of these plants that can have so much life giving force for us. Um, and just the knowledge of plants in general, like the coastal people, like they had so much more food off the shoreline, you know, and a huge, vast knowledge of all that. Or deserts, I would say, where all the plants look like they want to hurt you and maim you, but indigenous peoples know how to live there very, very well, you know. And it's almost silly to use the term food desert because people, indigenous peoples from the desert saw nothing but food around them, you know, because they looked at the world through that indigenous lens and they knew how to identify, they knew the relationships with the plants and that's important, that's an important lesson to think about, you know. So agriculture is another big piece to our puzzle because we have so much amazing celebrated agriculture that should be celebrated way more when it comes from our indigenous perspective because we helped the colonizers through agriculture because of our knowledge, you know, and they enslaved us and forced us to share our agricultural knowledge to help build what is this country on top of stealing indigenous peoples from Africa who also had vast agricultural knowledge and forcing them to do the same. Right, because agriculture spreads a vast, vast area across North America, starting at the bottom of Mexico. Corn culture shoots both directions into North and South America, and there's so many amazing products that come out of these agricultural pieces. Um, and you know the process of nixtamalization, you know, especially northward, it just follows it everywhere. Everybody was using that process of of mixing your corn with an alkaline bath when you're cooking it to unlock the full potential of the corn. You know. And it's not an accident. We've been utilizing uh, alkaline cooking for a long time, using things like wood ash and some minerals that would soften the water, or you know, to sorry, would make the water uh, more alkaline, basically. And it cooks food differently, and you can feel it in your body because it makes things more soluble. And when you do that, the corn unlocks everything. So you have niacin, which is really, really important, calcium, potassium, iron, zinc, all of these things, magnesium, all those all those minerals. You're able to absorb if you nixtamalize your corn products. Because we're taught like this is the way agriculture should be, but it's not. There's much, much better ways, and we can change that because this is dangerous for us. We know what's happening to our soil, and that's getting into all of our products no matter what. You can't even get away from it because it's in the middle of everything in the grocery store. And we're going to find out very soon what happens to us after we've been microdosing glyphosate for the past 20 years, you know. We're going to find out quickly what that's like because we're just lab rats, basically. And so... When we're looking at indigenous agriculture, there's so much history to uncover there. And there's so much um, different ways to think about agriculture, you know, whether it's raised garden systems down where in, in Mexico or uh, waffle gardens in the Southwest or the three sister mounds, you know, from the East Coast and inwards a little bit or row systems like Buffalo Birdwoman, Hidatsa and some of the tribes out like the Mandan, Rika, uh, Hidatsa. Um, and, you know, even today, like people are doing, being really imaginative. Um, this is a farm on Wakapomni, really close by where I grew up on Pine Ridge in the middle of nowhere. And they just created these underground greenhouses and they're growing so much amazing produce in the middle of winter in one of the most desolate, hard to reach places ever, you know, because when it snows, like nobody can get to those locations for days sometimes. And they've created these systems to just grow food, you know, because they can. And we all should be thinking about that. We could be doing some of these really simple things to stretch out our growing seasons much, much further in our cold regions, you know, because we need to be protecting every with everything we can, um, all of these seeds that are trying to be trademarked by the big corporations out there, because they just want control of your food, you know, so we have to stop that. And we have to celebrate that. And we have to make sure that these seeds stay in the hands of indigenous peoples, because we're not out there just to capitalize off it. We're there to make sure that these seeds are there for our following generations, you know, for our grandchildren and their grandchildren, we need to set up the systems to protect those seeds, because they've been going away fast within our own lifetime. So decolonizing our food system is 
taking that philosophy and moving forward with it. How do we pay respect to our ancestry, but how do we think about the health of our future generations and how can we actually do that in the weird, weird world that we live in today, right? Because indigenous foods are medicine to us. Like the more we eat of them, the better we're going to feel. And that's just a fact. You know, if you come and eat at Wamni, you're going to feel good when you leave because again, you're eating everything that's just good for you. There's nothing over processed. Again, everything's gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, soy-free, pork-free. It's just not free. Okay. So indigenous food sovereignty is also very possible, but we have to do it together. We can't allow, we can't wait for one person to do it or government officials to do it or one tribe to do it. Like we have to work together for this. We have to support each other from all of our diverse tribes. We have to be working together. You know, we're in this together and we have a shared, we have shared trauma. We have shared history. We have all these things. We might have diversity in different beliefs and different religions and different languages, but we're connected as indigenous peoples to this land and we should be treating each other as, 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 as that, as relations, you know, because we are relations. So it's important. So our vision is just trying to create a support system for other people to do what we've been doing in Minnesota um, to help out. So at the nonprofit that I created a few years back, which is Natives or North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems, we opened up a public public facing space called Indigenous Food Lab with two main goals of creating access to indigenous food and creating access to indigenous education. Basically, the two things that the United States government set out against us, we're trying to put that back as our as our pillars, right? So the Natives model which we have completely built out in Minnesota, and we're excited about it because it's something that we want to replicate everywhere. It's something we want to help everybody with. We're just trying to become a regional support system to help develop more healthy food operations out there by showcasing what's possible. So we have an indigenous market space where right now we have over 50 indigenous food producers that we're showcasing and growing and growing, and we're bringing in more. And uh, we have a production kitchen that's making a lot of indigenous products. We nixtamalize hundreds of pounds of corn a week and we turn that into masa, turn that into tortillas. We sell that to the restaurant, we sell that to the market space. And, you know, and, but we use it as a building block so we can teach people how to do some of these building blocks too and how to process these really large amounts of foods. We have our indigenous education studio, which is doing a lot of video work so we can start to steward our indigenous knowledge and just put it out there on video, you know, and making short videos because the young generation, I know there's a few, a few of you in here, but you learn things in like 30 seconds nowadays, you know, because we used to you read books that would take us a few days. You guys just watch a TikTok video and you learn the whole thing right there, you know, in like 30 seconds. So we want to use the power of that to be able to help things move forward. Um, and so in our market space, like I said, it's just creating something replicable because it not only creates access to these foods locally, but we've moved on to online and wholesale so we can sell bulk amounts of these foods and we can sell a lot of uh, products online if people just need a little bag of this or that, whatever it's raw rice or beans or whatever it might be. Um, it's uh, creating access to more of these food producers. We have um, we have the USDA licensing to be a co-packer. So we just finished a pilot project making an indigenous baby food with some Getio Kosamin, which somebody was talking about earlier this year and wild rice and other things and making really healthy products and getting more indigenous products out there on the market, you know? So there's a lot of opportunities for, the, for these kinds of market spaces and we built it small so we can replicate it everywhere. And we've even created a system where we just have shelving units and we got a grant so we can send out probably 50 shelving units all over the place, all over our region, and just help keep those shelves full. Because we just want to get some of those urban, uh, sorry, rural native convenience stores to give up a shelf of chips and have a sh have a shelf of healthy indigenous food products, you know, that they can easily rep replicate. That creates a distribution point. So if food relief is ever needed in that area, we have a point to send all these foods to so they can create pantry boxes, education boxes, whatever it is they need. It just gives us opportunity to get food out there and to move food back and forth because we can also work with people to create more products. Um, and that's happening in real time right now. And then we also have our production kitchen, which we use for education, for development, for creating all these products, for training, for research, all sorts of stuff, you know. And we're just creating a whole new generation of chefs who are able to do this kind of food on an institutional level. So we can feed everybody here. We can feed 10 times the people here, you know, and being very intentional about it, making sure that we're using indigenous food products when we're doing this and having health in mind because we want you guys to feel good, you know. And as chefs, we should be very conscious about how what we're feeding people and the products that we're utilizing and the foods that we make. Um, 
the classroom is there again just to steward our knowledge bases and to create as many videos as possible cooking videos language videos videos on on medicines on seed saving on farming technique on anything star knowledge crafting quilting could be anything we want it to be just a place to steward our own knowledge so everybody has access to it you know and keep it alive basically because so because because our religion was it was against the law to celebrate our religions for so long so many of our tribes went into some secrecy because it was dangerous to be a knowledge holder. So many of our, uh, not just our, our very recent generation of elders um, were persecuted, were put into jails, were killed, were violenced because of, because of being knowledge holders, you know? But we have to really understand the importance of our education system and start to really create that and make that more accessible to everybody, um, especially our indigenous youth and our indigenous community as much as possible. And it's easy to start thinking about education from indigenous perspective you know you just have to do it just put it out there just think about what does a non-eurocentric education system look like and we start building it because it's doable and you know so we've been creating lots of videos i'm not going to show this because i'm already over time a little bit but we're making lots of videos like these which is showcasing you know how to do some of these things because we have this classroom studio where our education team is just putting out i think we're doing about six videos a week right now and that's only going to expand as we grow so, but it's fun because we can. Um, so our food service um, operations and concept design, we can showcase like we, we already proved the point. We already made the proof of creating a restaurant in the modern day world, serving only indigenous foods. And it's working like having a restaurant with no ranch dressing that's popular. We did it, you know, it's possible. <laughs> Owamini won uh, best restaurant in the entire United States two years ago from the James Beard Foundation, which is like the Academy Award of, of rest for restaurants. It's the top award you can get. Just think about all the restaurants that open up across the country every year. And we beat out all of them. And we're not after Michelin stars. We're not built to just feed the rich. You know, we did something different and it stood out. And so it can be done is all is that's just the point that we're trying to do. And we've gotten a lot of press, but it's not about me. It's not about trying to be a famous chef and all these things. It's about what needs to happen for our next generations. And there's so many creative ideas we can for food service and we should be supporting food service operations as much as possible, which is why we're trying to create a support center for other chefs, tribes who wanted to create restaurants, you know, we just need to be really um, celebrating our stuff, you know, we don't need all you can eat uh, buffets at every single casino, you know, because we should be featuring the amazing diversity that we have out there, you know, and that's, that's just the truth. Because there's so much amazing creativity that can come out of this, a whole new generation of chefs can be creative, how we move forward with our own indigenous foods. Our goal is to open up indigenous food labs all over the place to have that same model with the market space, the classroom studio, the production kitchen and a satellite restaurant because the restaurants are part of our nonprofit. That we chose the restaurant to be an engine for the nonprofit because that's where a job creation comes. We have over 100 employees right now in the middle of winter that grows to about 150. And it's a place where we're doing about six million in sales at that restaurant downtown Minneapolis. Huge portion of that's going directly to food costs, and a huge chunk of that food cost is going directly to food producers. You know, so we're just raising that demand way up with just two kitchens in Minnesota. And if we just imagine if we had restaurant native restaurants all over the country, how much amazing demand and how much food growth we can have out of all of that. You know, so we have to raise that economy up. It just has to happen for us. So growing more food is really important. It's really important. Grow more food, please, you know, and lawns are stupid. I say that all the time. And it's a truth because they're just wide open spaces that are doing nothing for us. So make sure we're just growing food everywhere we can. Plant food trees, food plants, make diverse growing systems. Just do it because lawns are fucking stupid, right? Okay. Because the future is indigenous, but we have to do it together. And that's the biggest piece to this is we have to work together, which is why these conferences are great because it helps us bring together to see what everybody else is doing. How can we connect? How can we connect with each other? How can we support each other? You know, and what can you do? Um, support indigenous initiatives locally, globally, call out cultural appropriation, call colonialism in action, support fellow humans in need, create a relationship with the plant world, teach your children to eat and speak indigenous, create less trash, grow more food, and don't vote for fucking Trump. I don't think I need to say more after that, really. <laughs> All right, I'm over time, but that was a hundred and some slides. So 
thank you guys very much. Please support us. We need a lot of money to do what we're going to do, but we just want to do it to help everybody out there. We're moving into Montana this year. Next year, we're moving into Anchorage and we've got other places lined up, but we can set up a system to grow fast to become support centers. We're just trying to be culinary support because we need it out there. So help us so we can help you. That's all I'm saying. Thank you guys. Okay, we, I don't want to hold you from food, but I just want to make a couple of quick, um, you know, a couple of quick comments. When we were putting this agenda together, of course, Sean is a, is a big draw, um, but when we're talking about indigenous research, indigenous food lab, the connection there, I mean, all of that, I mean, that's part of indigenous research. Um, to make this event happen, you know, I, I mentioned our, our huge planning team, we'll give, give a shout out to them in a second, but for our main sponsors, the main host organizations here on campus, the College of Ag and Life Sciences, of course, I uh, want to give also just a, a call out to the Research Forward Project. We've got Professor Steph Tai, we've got Nan, saw Julie and Rue right there, um, and just our the amazing team for for that but a lot of funding support came from the research forward and i don't have the thing in in front of me to make sure i'm not missing any uh of our other uh sponsors but i know that the nelson institute paul robbins had presented earlier and um school of human ecology um Care lee out there somewhere and i know i'm probably going to be missing some other of our of our sponsors but putting on these events, it, it does take some resources. And so I want to, again, just thank all of our presenters and everyone who came. But then the law school is um, one of the places where I work here on campus. And I want to give Amanda White Eagle a chance to give a little, a few words. Just really quickly, I wanted to um, thank everyone for attending today's Indigenous Research Forum. Um, I have the privilege of uh, being one of Dan's supervisors, and I'd really just like to, to thank him for his efforts. One more round of applause. This morning, we were able to hear um, how to frame the conversation. We heard from uh, President John Green Deer, and I'm a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and so it was great to, to hear his remarks. And um, he really set the groundwork and the framework for where we hope to go. Um, I've just started working at the university. I've only uh, been here for about six months. I'm the Great Lakes Indigenous Law Center Director. Um, and part of this, I think, um, when we heard from Sean Sherman about some of the, the law and how we've evolved and thinking about colonialism and erasure, we really have the opportunity at the university to um, ensure that we have a place moving forward. And although we would look at the Morrill Act and um, say that uh, the University of Wisconsin is a land-grant university, uh, the university is making steps, and I know that there's criticism there, and it should be more, uh, but I would encourage you to go to your communities and look at the Wisconsin Tribal Educational Promise. Um, it extends not only to undergraduate, uh, but also to medical school and the law school, and hopefully we'll have more Indigenous scholars, more Indigenous research, and an opportunity moving forward. So as I'm standing between you and dinner, on behalf of the law school, I'd just like to thank everybody who had an opportunity uh, with this, including the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the Nelson Institute, the University of Wisconsin Extension, and the law school. And again, I'm um, very appreciative of Dan Cornelius as the Great Lakes Indigenous Law Center Outreach um, Community Manager for the efforts that have been made today. Thank you. So as I said, I mean, putting on these events, it, it takes a lot more time than what you think it's going to when you start. Every time, oh, no, it's not gonna take that much. And the only way I can get this done is with all of these people that are here. And I know we've got probably a few more. Doug, don't sneak away. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just want to give uh, a shout out and an acknowledgement to the whole team here because, you know, Frankie, you were stuffing name tags last night. 
but yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible without everybody that is here. So just a quick round of applause. Oh, and um, Katie has reminded me a couple of times that everything we were, um, this was live streamed. We had, I don't know, 50, 50 some people that were joining um, as throughout the day. And so the recording is available and we kind of check in of what we're going to do on that. But um, we are ready to to eat and we have a quick prayer from um, President Green Deer before we eat. And I think at some point here, the wall is going to go up and we'll be able to uh, to have, where's that, where's that little red uh, call help button <laughs> and press it right now and, it, and, it, um, and it'll be coming up, but we're going to have a great dinner out there. And please, this is the chance when we have the reception, just to chat, to decompress a little bit. I know people probably have quite a bit of questions for Sean. That was a great, a great presentation, but Again, thank you, everybody, and we're going to go have some great food. <laughs>